Um, so today's talk then is called 20 Notable Citizens of Bloomfield. And these, the photograph here is two of the notable citizens, my gran and granda. So I'm going to run through 20 of them, as I say, and I'll be have photographs of each of the 20 of the houses of where each of the 20 people lived. So the first one then is this one. This is 5 Kensington Avenue. This is where my gran and granda lived. Um, so a lot of the research for this talk, I have, it's for a research for a book, forthcoming book of mine called um, 100 Houses of East Belfast. And so a number of people have recorded their or dictated their stories. So uh, I've grown up in East Belfast, including my mum. So this is my mum's story. Um, the first 23 years of, her, of my life, I lived at Five Kensington Avenue. My mother and father were mar married in 1944 and they borrowed 600 pounds from my granny Mays to buy the house, their only home for their entire married life. It was a very happy house and I can still remember lots of very nice neighbours. My father worked in the Scribbins Camp Biscuit Factory on the Springfield Road. He had to get up early every morning to catch the bus, first bus at 5.30 or 6 o'clock. My mother was a stay-at-home housewife who looked after my brother John and I. When I was 15, I left Bloomfield Collegiate to work as a tracer in Horn and Wolf. To get to work, I walked, caught the bus or cycled there. After three years as an apprentice in the shipyard, I then moved to work for the civil service as a tracer. It was based at the law courts and then Churchill House on most occasions, still going home to Five Kensington Avenue at lunchtime. In those days, the civil service had a marriage bar, meaning that the only single woman were employed. So 1968 was a big year in my life as I had to leave work, got married and also moved out of Kensington Avenue after 23 happy years living there. My mum and dad continued to live in Five Kensington Avenue too until my mum, mummy died in 2001, meaning that my, my parents spent 57 years living in, at the same house, number five, Kensington Avenue. This is my grand and granda on their wedding day. I spent many happy times in Kensington Avenue. This is a photograph then of me uh, to the right there with her uh, in Kensington Avenue with my grand and granda and my brother and my cousins, Carly and Kelly, and importantly, Mac the dog. That's the first property, that's the most important one to me anyway in terms of Bloomfield, 5 Kensington Avenue. Second one then is this property, 125 Hindford Street. And you can see from the plaque there, this is where Van Morrison lived here from 1945 until 1961. This plaque was put up with the Belfast Blues Appreciation Society. So here's a photograph of Van with his mum and dad and dog. George Ivan, known as Van Morrison, was born on 31st August 1945 at 125 Hindford Street, the only child of George Morrison, a shipyard electrician, and Violet Stitt Morrison, who had been a singer and a tap dancer in her youth. So there's a photograph of Violet in her latter years, um, still singing, and that seems to be in a, when she was uh, singing to the folks in a nursing home. From 1950 to 1956, Van Morrison attended the nearby Elm Grove Primary School, my mum's school as well, and then Orangefield High School. During Van's youth, his father owned one of the largest record collections in Northern Ireland, acquired during his time working for a while in Detroit, Michigan in the early 1950s. The young Van Morrison therefore grew up listening to artists such as Jelly, Re Jelly Roll Morton, Ray Charles, Lead Belly, Sonny Terry and Bernie McGee and Solomon Burke. George Morrison died in 1998, and he is buried in Redburn Cemetery. Sorry, 1988. He's buried in uh, Redburn Cemetery in Hollywood. And Violet, then she died on the 31st of May 2016. And she's buried beside her, her husband then, and again in Redburn. This photograph then shows you the view down Hindford Street. And um, in the distance then is the, the so the Morrison's house would have been on the left and in the distance then you can just make out the Owen O'Cork mill and that's where Van Morrison's mother Violet would have worked so she didn't have too far to go to work. Then this is the next one this is uh, 26 Ramcott Street on the 10th of July 1922 42 year old Henry Little of 26 Ramcott Street 
was shot dead at number 30 during a struggle in which he, tr he tried to intervene on behalf of uh, Catholic neighbours who were being forcibly evicted. The incident was sadly one of numerous fatalities during the Troubles of the 1920s. Where uh, Henry Little died is no number 30 to the left there, and he lived number 26 to the right. So again, that's number 30 to the left, and then number 26, where Henry Little uh, lived to the right. This is a photograph then of Henry Little uh, during his time uh, serving uh, during the Great War. And then this is his headstone. So you can see it in the Donald Cemetery. You can see it just reads, in memory of Henry Little, the beloved husband of Elizabeth Little, who gave his life for a neighbour on the, the 10th July 1922. So often the, uh, the 1920s troubles are um, forgotten, um, but I think it's important to remember folks like this man, Henry Little, who um, lost his life, as I mentioned earlier, trying to stand up for Catholic neighbours who were being evicted. The next property then is this property, 38 Dunraven Crescent. Um, Billy Bingham lived in this house. Uh, Billy Bingham was born, well, Billy Bingham uh, Senior and Junior. Billy Bingham Junior was born on 5th August 1931, initially playing football for St Donner's Youth Club. His first professional club was Glen Torren, where he played uh, with the Glens between 1948 and 1950. He made the move to England, then spent eight years in Sunderland, making 227 appearances. In 1958, he switched to Luton Town, making close to 100 league appearances in a three-year spell. This was followed by a two-year association with Everton, where he again uh, went close to 100 league appearances. He finished his career after breaking his leg in a match for Port Vale, against Port Vale, sorry, in 1964 at the age of 33. He had scored 133 goals in 525 appearances in all domestic competitions. Between 1951 and 1963, he won 56 caps for Northern Ireland, scoring 10 international goals and played at 1958 World Cup. This is Billy Bingham's. Billy, Billy Bingham was asked a number of years ago to to uh, nominate his favourite ever photograph, and this is the photograph that he nominated. Uh, this is obviously Bingham, Billy Bingham to the left, and the man to the right is a man called Johnny Belshaw. Johnny Belshaw was the Glen's trainer, and uh, known as Schnozzle Durante. That was his nickname, and you know this photograph is taken at the Oval because you can see the pillbox between the two of them in the background, so the pillbox at the Oval is still there. So it's a great photograph. Apparently, um, Snodgill Durante was, uh, Johnny Belshaw was threatening, not, uh, telling Billy Bingham to get his hair cut. This is Billy Bingham then uh, in later life. So his management career started in Southport in 1965 before he was appointed manager of Northern Ireland two years later. During his time as an international manager, he also took charge at Plymouth, Argyle, then later Linfield, leading the Blues to a quadruple in the 1970-71 season, his only season in charge. 1971, he was appointed head coach of the Greece national side. Uh, two years later, he was appointed, he returned to the domestic game to manage Everton. In 1980, he was reappointed as Northern Ireland manager, his final position, and the post he held for the next 13 years, leading his nation to the World Cup finals in 1982 and 1986. So originally the Binghams lived um, just near the short strand there, but then they moved in to Dunraven Crescent. Of course, a lot of people made fun of Billy Bingham's accent because and referred to him as Billy Bingham. So that's Billy Bingham, still alive and living in Southport. So just around the corner then is 26 Dunraven Parade, and that was the home of the Blanche Flower family. And Jackie and Selena were Blanchflower. They moved to Dunraven Park around 1926. They're, they had a son called Danny, Robert Dennis, known as Danny, born in February 1926. And Jackie was born in 1933, William in 1939, with two older siblings also lived in the property. Danny was born, as I say, 10th February 1926. He left Belfast to join Barnsley in 1949 
then moved to Aston Villa in March 1951, before his, his most successful years captaining Spurs during their double winning season of 1916-61. Danny also made 58, 56 appearances for Northern Ireland, retiring at the age of 38 and became a respected football journalist as well as managing Northern Ireland. He was ranked as the greatest player ever in Spurs history by the Times in 2009. This is the Blanche Flower brothers here together, uh, Jackie to the left and Danny to the right. Jackie's often forgotten. So this is Jackie here, an unusual uh, pose while he's playing for Man United. He left Belfast in the late 1950s, telling friends at Belfast Technical College that he was leaving to join Busby's Nursery, Matt Busby's Nursery. And he played on 105 occasions for Northern Ireland, sorry, for Manchester United, and 12 times for Northern Ireland before his career was cut short at the age of 24 as a result of injuries sustained in the Munich air disaster in 1958. And this is a, the image to the right then is Danny, sorry, Jackie, uh, receiving treatment, but as I say, after the Munich air crash. I sadly never played uh, again after because due to injuries, both mental and physical, from the that he got from the uh, Munich during the Munich air crash. So near neighbours to the Blanche Flowers at the time were the Bingham family, uh, and with the respective mothers apparently travelling together to international matches to watch their sons playing for Northern Ireland. The Blanche Flowers then moved uh, to 49 Grace Avenue, and that's that property here. Uh, where a blue plaque was erected to Danny in March 2015. So they actually lived in Dunraven Park, this property, for much longer, but the, um, the, the residents of that, the, the, the owners of that house uh, objected to a blue plaque, so that's why it went round then to um, Grace Avenue, where they lived for a shorter period of time. Interestingly, this is the Role of Honour in Bloomfield Presbyterian, and this mentions both, you can see their bottom right, it mentions Danny and Jackie as having served in the Second World War. So this property then is 37 Mayflower Street, and the Keenan family moved in around 1960, uh, including 10-year-old Brian Keenan. He, he initially lived at Ab Evelina Street off the New New Lodge Road until moving to Mayflower Street in 1959. He attended Orangefield Boys Secondary School, uh, but left early to work as a van boy with Cassaray Laundry. He then began an apprenticeship as a heating engineer. He continued, continued his education at night school, and after winning a national poetry competition, attended the, Ulster, the University of Ulster at Coleraine. He worked in adult education and as a community worker, before leaving Northern Ireland in 1985 to teach English at the American University in Beirut. Despite holding an Irish passport, a fact that which led to amusement and hostility on occasions in his native East Belfast, uh, Keenan was kidnapped by Shia militiamen in April 1986. He was held in increasingly brutal conditions in the suburbs of Beirut and in the Becca Valley for the next four and a half years. The story of his abduction and imprisonment and the close bonds that developed between Keenan and his fellow hostages, the English journalist John McCarthy, is told in his best-selling award-winning memoir, An Evil Cradling. Keenan now lives in Dublin with his wife and two children, having previously lived in Westport, County Mayo. So this is 37 Mayflower Street, and you'll see that a neighbor is uh, an orange man in lockdown. Still, have you had that up for on the window for quite a while? And this is Brian Keenan after he'd been released. Uh, so you'll see that the famous, well, famous in my book anyway, uh, photographs, sorry, posters, uh, were asking for Brian Keenan's release. And then um, thankfully, they've been able to put the two two sisters um, have been able to put up um, free over the posters. So Brenda, the sister to the right, she lived in Ballybean, and Elaine to the left. I even know Elaine uh, these days. So two campaigning sisters um, got, 
their brother released. And this is him after he was released. This is in front to the left, in the front of the city hall, under the um, just the main the front entrance. And then this is him with in, in, uh, a number of years later with John McCarthy, his fellow hostage. The next property then is this, 9 Bloomdale Street, and a man called Robert Bob Bishop lived in this house. And this is Bob Bishop here with the man who he is credited with discovering, George Best. Bishop was a bachelor, lived with his sister in Bloomdale Street. According to the George Best's book, um, Approved Biography and Mortal, Bishop had three hobbies, budgies, border collie, dogs, and above all, football. He was a riveter in Harlem the Wolf, and his free time, he ran the Boyland Youth Club at 46 Lomond Avenue. In 1950, Manchester United appointed him a scout, a local scout, paying him £2 a week plus expenses, also installing a telephone in Bishop's house to communicate with England. In more than 35 years, Bishop brought more than 100 players to Old Trafford, including George Best, Jimmy Nicholl, David McQuarrie, Sammy McElroy and Norman Whiteside. He was a distinctive figure with a cigarette hanging from his lips, a v-neck sweater in winter and a white shirt in summer. The Bishop also brought, as he was known, the Bishop also brought young players to Helms Bay, where he rented an austere cottage called the Mance for five shillings a week as a base for football camps. All of those guys, the likes of uh, Best, Whitehead, etc., McElroy, could all remember uh, going down to the, the, the manse with Bob Bishop. Then this is the next, these are the next couple of properties, and these relate to James Brown. James Brown is the grandfather of the current James Brown, former managing director of James Brown and Sons Funeral Directors. He was born in Bally Bay, County Monaghan, and emigrated to Boston, Massachusetts as a young man. After several years, James Brown returned to Ireland, arriving in Belfast with only tuppence in his pocket, not enough uh, to pay for the journey to Monaghan train station, so he walked 65 miles home. James then relocated to Belfast in the late 1890s, working initially at the Coal Keys. James saved enough money to buy a horse and harness, which he hired out, often working for William Hine, who lived at Brooklyn, which is now the PSNI headquarters. James had met Elizabeth Harris, also from Bally Bay, with the couple experiencing a Christian conversion, with Elizabeth only agreeing to marry James if he stopped drinking alcohol. According to Brown family members, Elizabeth was five foot tall and wore size one shoes, whilst James was apparently six foot three inches tall and wore size 13 shoes. The couple married at Belmont Presbyterian Church on the 17th of January 1900, and a total of eight children, five of whom were born when the, the couple lived at 38 Murrogate Street, which is the property to the left of the photograph. Whilst living at Murrogate Street, uh, James then brought a, bought a cart, commencing work as a coal merchant. James then secured land on Bloomfield Avenue, building, the house, building a house at number 105, and that's a property to the right of the photograph, and a yard and stabling, stables on the Bearsbridge Road side of the property. He subsequently became a furniture remover, after which he closed the coal business. James and Elizabeth's final two children were born when the couple was living at 105 Bloomfield Avenue. James then built premises at, at 300 Newton Arts Road, opening the funeral directors there, with the business successfully continuing to the present day. James died in 1947, with Elizabeth dying in 1955. Both were interred in the graveyard of the Second Valley Bay Presbyterian uh, Church in County Monaghan. This is James, the original James Brown to the left, and then this is Grant, his grandson, the uh, most recent managing director of James Brown Funeral Services, in to the right. The next property is this one. This is 12 Uniondale Street, and this is where Dr. John Pitt lived. In 1907, um, John's father, known as Cohen, called Cohen, K O H N Pitt, he, he was registered as being a shoemaker, and he was living there. You can see in the, you might be able to see it in the um, main door, top of the door, has this little sign, so blown it up, no visits by Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, please. So this is where uh, Dr. John Pitt had his premises, and this is 
two photographs of the same building at uh, junction of Templemore Avenue and uh, Newton Arge Road. So that's where he had his, his uh, doctor's practice for many years. And so Pitt Park is more or less opposite that, and that's named in honour of Dr. Pitt. This is Dr. Pitt then, uh, a representation of him, and this is part of the Eastside Lives project. Uh, Dr. Pitt is one of um, about a dozen um, images that, uh, dotted around East Belfast, and this tells a story about Dr. Pitt himself, Dr. John Pitt, I say, who lived at Uniondale Street, and this, this mural is located nearby. Uh, you can see to on Dr. Pitt's right shoulder, there's a representation of a cinema, because apparently when he, uh, or cinema reel, when he was uh, snowed under and work, he used to just close up and then go to the cinema to get a bit of rest and relaxation. This is the next property, this is 7 Elmdale Street, and the Ellison family lived here. Robert Ellison was a carter, and he lived there, here from 1907 to 1932. So a daughter of Robert's was Selina uh, Ellison, and Robert worked as a carter with English, uh, in the English factory nearby at Hollywood Arches, and he kept his carts along with his chickens in the yard beside Seven Elm Dale Street. Uh, Selena Ellison was a competent footballer in the, the days before women's football was, uh, became more fashionable than it is now, and she captained Bloomfield Ladies. According to her son William, um, his brothers, known as the, when, when Selena married, she mar married John Blanchflower, and so according to William, one of the sons, Blanche Flower brother, brothers, gained their sporting prowess from their mother rather than their father. A fact confirmed by Danny Blanche Flower himself in an article entitled, My Mother Was an Inside Right. So as I mentioned earlier, after Selena and John married, um, they moved to Raven Park and then Grace Avenue. So, at the moment, in the th uh, Lyric Theatre in Belfast, is this play, Rough Girls, and um, it's by Carolyn O'Neill. And I was told initially that this represents um, the, the, one, the team that uh, Selena, um, known as Sis Blanchflower, or Ellison, would have played for in those days. So that's Danny Blanchflower, Danny and Jackie Blanchflower's mother is represented in that play. This is the next property then, this is 28 Greenville Street and this is where George Jones lived. He was born in 1943, he was in my mum's class in Elm Grove Primary School. As a teenager he started entertaining in the show bands era and was a member of the band of Monarchs, which included his boyhood friend Van Morrison. The Monarchs toured Europe for three months as the International Monarchs, Monarchs before returning to Belfast and disbanding. George then moved to the comedy cabaret circuit by forming the well-known band Club Sound. His first break into radio came with a Sunday slot in downtown radio. He went on to work for the, for the BBC, hosting his own show, Just Jones, for BBC Radio Ulster. It's won a Sony Radio Academy Award for Best Local Radio Presenter. This is George Jones here. He's now retired from radio and you can see he does a bit of painting, and then there's, he still also plays with club sounds. This is club sound, um, bottom right. This is the next one then, this is Five Wingrove Gardens, and this is where a man called Joseph L. Stewart lived. This is Joseph Stewart here. He was born in Cross Bar in 1891. He opened his first shop, Greenville Cash Stores, in 1911, near to his home, and it was at 334 Bearsbridge Road. 1918, the property is recorded as Creevyville, with the occupant recorded as Joseph L. Stewart Grocer. He was living at Five Wingrove Gardens when his first wife, Catherine, died on 3rd December 1934, aged only 54. Stewart eventually opened more than 70 stores, known as Stewart's Cash Stores and then Stewart's Supermarkets. He was a notoriously demanding employer. No employee was allowed to sit 
during their shift. In 1935, Joseph sold his business empire to Weston's, the Canadian international grocery business, effectively making him a millionaire overnight. Stuart later lived at Rose Park in Dundonald and then Circular Road in Belfast and finally to Knock Road in Belfast when he was living when he died is 88 on the 27th of October 1969, the day before I was born. That's Joseph Stuart there, uh, as I know those phot photographs. Then over off to Cypress Avenue, off Cypress Avenue now, this property is 6 Sanford Avenue. And that was the home of Roderick Chisholm. This is Roderick Chisholm here. He was born in Dumbarton in 1868. And he was at the forefront in the design of both the Olympic and Titanic uh, whilst living at this property. Uh, one of Titanic's nine strong guarantee group, like the rest of his counterparts, 43-year-old Roderick died in the sinking and his body, if recovered, was never identified. Essentially, the guarantee group were hand-picked men uh, handpicked by Harlan and Wolf um, to guarantee the safe passage of the um, Titanic and they all went down with the ship. Roderick's wife Susan was still living at 6 Sanford Avenue when she died on 22nd February 1961, aged 87. Roderick is commemorated on the Titanic memorials in the grounds of Belfast City Hall and in a simple plaque at the bottom of the avenue erected by the Titanic Foundation in 2000. Belfast Titanic Society President Susie Miller recently moved into this property. And uh, so Susie's great grandfather died in the sinking of the Titanic. So it's fitting that the Titanic link to 6 Sanford Avenue continues to this day. And this is just round the corner. This is 11 Sunbury Avenue. And this is where another member of the Titanic's guarantee group lived. This is this man, Anthony Wood Frost. He was known as Artie and like Roderick Chisholm, I mentioned previously, he worked in both Olympic and Titanic, in this, his case, supervising the fitting of machinery. Also a member of the Titanic Guarantee Group, he's commemorated at the base of the family headstone at Roselawn Cemetery, as lost on Titanic 1912. And again, like Chisholm, he's also commemorated on the Titanic Memorials in Belfast City Hall and on the Titanic Foundation plaque at the bottom of the avenue. In another parallel with the Chisholms, Hardy's wife, Elizabeth died on 23rd February 1961, one day after Susan Chisholm. Um, so she was age 72 and she was living at two Hillcrest Gardens when she died. And both Titanic widows are buried within meter, meters of each other in Roselawn. So that's a couple who, a um, couple of widows whose husband died, husbands died in the same night and they died one day apart from each other. This property here is on the Bears Bridge Road, uh, right next to St. Donard's and um, Church of Ireland on the Bears Bridge Road. And it was previously uh, inhabited by the Reverend Ian Paisley. He then moved around the corner to Cypress Avenue, and this is the drive down to the house, and then that's the house there. Um, so this is Paisley in his uh, firebrand days. He became an evangel evangelical minister in 1946, co-founding the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster in 1951 and was its leader until 2008. He became involved in politics in the late 1950s, becoming in 1970 Member of Parliament for North Antrim and then founding the Democratic Unionist Party, which he would lead for an almost 40 years. In 1979, he became a member of the European Parliament Throughout the Troubles, he was seen as a firebrand and the face of hardline unionism. His efforts helped bring down the Sunningdale Agreement of 1974, and he also opposed the Anglo-Irish Agreement of 1985, and then the Good Friday Agreement of 1998. 2005, his DUP became the largest unionist party in Northern Ireland, following the, the Good Friday, sorry, the St Andrews Agreement. The EUP then finally agreed to share power with Sinn Féin. Um, and Paisley and uh, Sinn Féin's Martin McGuinness became First Minister and Deputy First Minister respect, respectively in May 2007. 
and had formed an unlikely friendship. This is a famous photograph then, the one uh, when the, the two became known as Chuckle Brothers. Um, so Paisley stepped down as first minister and a DUP leader in 2008 and left politics in 2011. He's made a life here as Baron Banside in 2010 and he died on 12th September 2014, aged 88, and was buried in Ballygown Free Presbyterian Church graveyard. This is the next property. This is again on Cypress Avenue, and this property is called um, Roiding, number 25. This is where, uh, so you'll see that above the door it shows you the, the name Roiding. This man here lived in this house. Sammy, Dean Sammy Crooks. At the time when he was living in that house, he was the a minister in St John's Orangefield, but not too far away. Then from 1970 to 1985, he was the uh, the Dean of Belfast, and he was the man credited with um, starting the Black Santa campaign, which still continues to this day. So the photograph then to the left and to the right top left right and right um, shows Sammy Crooks um, in his guise as the Black Santa. He was appointed an OBE in 1981. Uh, sadly, and after his retirement in 1986, he was killed in a, he was only 66 in a car crash outside St. Field. And then in December 2014, a blue plaque was erected at St. Anne's to commemorate uh, the late great Sammy Crooks. This is the next property again on Cypress Avenue, and this number 42 is Sandy Croft. And a man called Joseph Lewis lived here. He was an, an uncle of C.S. Lewis, and uh, he was C.S. Lewis's dad's eldest brother, and he died in uh, 19. 1908, is only 53, and his wife Mary died in 1937, still living at that property, at 42 Cypress Avenue. So 1908 was C.S. Lewis's uh, worst year, um, and he lost both his mother, so he lost his mother, his uh, paternal Granda and um, his uncle who lived in that house, Sandy Croft. And C so C.S. Lewis in the photograph at the top is, is the baby sitting on his father's knee. And so Joseph Lewis isn't actually in this photograph, but Richard Lewis the, is um, up left. That's, um, that's the Lewis. That's, Albert and Joseph Lewis's father. And they're commemorated, sorry, they're buried in Belfast City Cemetery. So there are five plots here um, relating to the Lewis's or the Hamiltons who they were married into. And so the plaque, sorry, the grave, the plot is in the immediate foreground is C.S. Lewis's mum and dad, say his mum died in 1908. And then to the left then, in a similar cross, is where Joseph is and the man who lived in Sandy Croft is buried, so he died in 1908. Next one then is 20 Cypress Gardens, and that's where the Chambers family lived. Chambers Motors was the first automobile manufacturer in Ireland, building vehicles by hand and featuring high quality components designed and fabricated in-house. Founder of the company, Jack, had earlier designed and constructed the first Vauxhall car in 1902-3, Vice Managing Director of the Vauxhall Iron Works in London. He resigned in January 1904 and filed a master patent in 19, May 1904 for a Chambers car featuring coil springs and twin cylinder transverse engine with chain drive. Production was undertaken in Cuba Street in Belfast in association with Jack's brothers Robert and Charlie. Only four Chambers motors Sorry, only four Chambers cars are known to exist today, including a model from 1908, which is displayed, as you can see from the photograph, in the Ulster Museum in Belfast. We have two more to go then. 
this is a fine house um, called Fairhaven on the North Road, just the junction of Martini Avenue. And this is where the Piggott family lived. The Piggott brothers, uh, well, they're, they're, they both worked for the English Bakery in Belfast, and their father, Tom, was the chairman. The English brothers were returning from a business trip to an exhibition in London uh, on board the Princess Victoria. Sadly, they both died during the Princess Victoria disaster, 31st January 1953. And Spence was 28, uh, and he's to the left of the photograph, and Lennox was 19 at the time of his death. death. Their father then died um, uh, four years later, on 15th August 1957, and their mother um, in 1996. The Pickett Brothers are commemorated in this um, plaque at Bloomfield Bakery, then Inglis's, um, then now known as Wise Pies. And for the eagle eyes amongst you, you might be able to see it first. It says their bottom section, first manager, Tom Pickett. Tom Pickett went down with his sons on Princess Victoria. In fact, that's not right because it was, it was his two sons that passed away as a result of the Princess Victoria disaster. Down right in Martini Avenue then, there was a man called Thomas Galt. He was a manager of the Leaf Department in Gallagher's Cigarette Factory in Belfast. And he also drowned as a result of the Princess Victoria disaster. And a water stain photograph of his wife was found in Tom's uh, pocket when his body was recovered. And all three of those victims um, of the Princess Victoria disaster um, are buried in Knock So the last house to feature here is in Grand Parade, number 186, and that's where Fred Starrett lives, so the house to the left. This is Fred Starrett here at the top at the eye of the moustache, and then again down below there. He was, he lived at 186 Grand Parade, as I said, and died shortly after being injured when a remote control bomb hidden behind hoardings was detonated when his UDR mobile patrol arrived at a permanent vehicle checkpoint in Royal Avenue in Belfast on the 25th of February 1988. He was aged 22 years and eight months. Also killed was the man represented to the right there, Private James Cummings, and he's interred in Roselawn. Starrett is interred in the Donald Cemetery. Fred's father, Freddie, died on the 27th of November 1982, aged 62. And his mother, Susanna, died in 2009, aged 76. Both also registered as living at this property, 186 Grand Parade. So both Starrett and Cummings were both members of the Orange Order. And so every year then this uh, uh, parade takes place to the um, site of their uh, sad deaths in Royal Avenue. So that's just my most recent book, 2020, 20 graves in each of 20 different local cemeteries, available from my mobile merchandising unit, in other words, my car. So folks, thanks very much for listening.